<sighs> Online. It's been a while since the beta. Wonder if they changed anything. Aw, oh, come on, really? That's just disgusting. Activate ad blocker. <laughs> uh, I am going to burn this f to the ground. So I'm not a huge Disney person. I have nothing against the company. Actually, yes, I do. They're horrible and monopoly trying to take over the world. But I've never really felt all that strongly about Walt Disney Studios movies. I don't really dislike many of them, but they've just never appealed to me personally all that much. I'm much more of a Leica or DreamWorks person. But then a little movie called Wreck-It Ralph came out in 2012 and... Alright Disney, you got me. You finally made a movie that I love. And when talk of the sequel started floating around in 2013, I was hyped. Sure, Wreck-It Ralph isn't a movie that needs a sequel, but there's a ton about the world that could be expanded upon. I was excited to see it. And then the movie actually came out. Now, I should make it clear that this video is intended to be an overly thorough analysis of I feel that Ralph Breaks the Internet, which I'll be referring to as War 2 from this point onward, is a bad sequel. There are plenty of things in this movie that are terrible, but I'm going to mostly be focusing on things like basic story structure over... Ugh, that. And if you like this movie, great. But I didn't, and I'm here to discuss why. Originally, I was planning to just talk about why this movie fails as a sequel rather than its own story, and for the most part, that's what I want to focus on. However, there's a lot about this plot that's just plain not good, so I'm going to go over the actual story before we deep dive into the stuff that fucks it up relative to the first movie. So what's crazy about this movie is that the first few minutes are actually pretty good. It feels like we're right back at Litwalks again, and it legit bar a smile to see these old characters. Unfortunately, that goes right down the drain the second the plot starts. So things kick off with Vanellope breaking the console. Now there are many, many things wrong with the world building in this scene that we'll be covering in later parts, but for right now, fine. We have our main conflict set up early on in the movie. After this, we have a scene of the Sugar Rush Racers being rehomed. This scene has one itty bitty problem, that being that it has nothing to do with the main plot. You see, in the first movie, Felix and Calhoun's B-plot connects directly with Ralph and Vanellope's A-plot. Ralph runs away and sneaks into Hero's duty. Felix tails him because him doing that broke his game, and Calhoun follows to track down a cyborg. Felix then becomes useful in the climax as he fixes a plot important item while Calhoun keeps everyone from dying. Nice and intertwined. Here, the B-plot affects so little of the A-plot that you can cut it out and not lose anything. Oh. Wow. Anyway, Ralph realizes that he can use the internet to fix this because Felix makes a weird noise that sounds a little like e-boy, which makes him think of eBay. All the script needed to do was have Ralph sit around Game Central Station being depressed and then knows the Wi-Fi outlet. What the hell am I witnessing here? Yeah! yeah. Say, say it again? Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. boy. Yeah. Say it again? Yeah, boy. 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 Okay, so from this point, the plot becomes surprisingly straightforward. They go to the internet, see some pop-ups, bid on the reel, realize they have no money, return to the pop-ups to get money in a nice bit of setup and payoff, and then are introduced to another main plot point by going to Slaughter Race as part of their mini-quest. Shank then tells them to go to BuzzTube. Now, it is at this exact moment that this plot starts to crash and burn. Notice how the plot point of BuzzTube comes up out of nowhere. You'd expect Ralph and Vanellope to go back to his family to do many other smaller jobs in place of the one large one, which is even what Ralph suggests at one point. This would give the writers the opportunity to show off the vast world of online gaming and give the characters a chance to explore different worlds. But instead, they just kind of go to BuzzTube. And to quote Ralph, All right, fine. Do it your way. But I'm telling you right now, that BuzzTube place is a terrible idea. The thing about BuzzTube is, because its role could be filled with doing jobs for his family, it doesn't really need to be there. Like, it takes up a huge portion of the middle of the movie, and it never comes back. It's nothing to do with video games, nor does it have anything to do with the plot point of getting the wheel. Also, these are some of the worst fake viral videos I think I've ever seen, and they date this movie something fierce. Ugh. Then somehow the movie goes off on pointless tangent inside of an already pointless tangent. Vanellope is supposed to advertise in Slaughter Race, but Ralph redirects her to- Oh no! Look, we'll talk about this play and product placement in a moment. Right after we get done talking about Raycon Earbuds, the sponsor of this- Fuck, no. I can't even bring myself to do this, guy. Don't get Raycon Earbuds, I've heard they suck. Anyway, it's at this moment that the movie just kind of stops. Like, nothing happens during the entire product placement scene. For six minutes, it's just Disney shilling out their product while the plot doesn't progress. 
It's kind of amazing in how bad it is. It doesn't have anything to do with video games. It barely has anything to do with the internet, aside from the fact that there are princesses on it. And it's disgusting and corporate in a way that honestly grosses me out a little. The scene's also weirdly out of place. Yes suggests sending Vanellope to slaughter race because, and I quote, Well, since Candy Girl comes from an arcade game, I'm thinking she'd be good in the gaming district. This would, in fact, be correct. This is a movie franchise about video games and we need to focus on slaughter race because it's a plot point. But what do they do instead? Send her to, oh my god, I hate it. This makes no sense from a writing perspective. And what's crazy is that the writers claimed that they were intentionally trying to avoid doing this. The fact that Ralph and Vanellope are in the internet where there are billions of websites, it felt like an organic part of the story to get them there without feeling like a shilling, frankly. We're very aware of that. We don't want it to feel like a Disney advertisement or anything like that, so we made sure it's integral to the story and natural for the characters to be there. Uh, directors? Hey, directors? I hate to break it to you, but this entire scene is neither integral to the story nor natural. The only thing it accomplishes is some setup for the climax and some clarifications of Vanellope's new goal, established via an I Want song. All you had to do was have Vanellope go to slaughter race to advertise like she was supposed to. Shank offers to do a real race with her, and that's what causes Vanellope to end up talking with her in the car and Ralph overhearing her. This would give Vanellope an even stronger motivation to stay if she'd have more time to bond with Shank. You should never just be able to cut out huge chunks of a movie plot like this. If you can, it means those scenes should either be reworked or scrapped. I can't think of any scenes in the first movie that could be easily cut. Maybe the Laffy Taffy scene, which doesn't lead to anything other than advancing Felix and Calhoun's relationship. But this movie? It's so busy in certain pointless scenes that it also includes a scene of Ralph reading Anne and Hate that has nothing to do with anything. Because Disney, TM, is woke, TM, and addressing real issues, TM, copyright Disney 2018. Now, notice what happens to the plot after this scene. Before this, the plot was simple, make money to get the wheel to fix Sugar Rush. But after this point, the original plot is just straight up forgotten. It's so not important that they don't even show the resolution on screen. Ralph paying for the wheel, Sugar Rush being fixed and the racers going home? Eh, who cares, we have... let me check my notes here... Codependency issues to talk about? Eh, sure. So the last act of this movie is honestly one of the worst parts of the script writing rise, right next to BuzzTube. Alright, first, having the princesses show up and save the day, it felt like this movie came to life and physically slapped me across the face. I have never seen more blatant product placement in my life. This should have been Shank's moment, providing a chance for Ralph to warm up to her and reinforce Vanellope's decision. This is like in the first movie, instead of Vanellope driving the car into Diet Coal Mountain, it was Zangief. I think you can see the problem. And secondly, the part with the viruses comes with no real setup. In the first movie, the cybugs are introduced early on and are a looming threat throughout the movie. But here, Ralph just decides to infect Slaughter Race with a virus, and the only setup is a quick scene at the beginning wherein they get stuck in Tron. But Box, I hear you cry. Doesn't Ralph's goal of obtaining a metal change in the first movie? Well, yes and no. While the metal plot does segue into a different plot point at the end of War 1, there's a major difference between that and the climax of 2. And that difference is, War 1 was never just focused on the metal. It was focused on Ralph's character. Ralph's goal in War 1 isn't technically getting a medal. Getting a medal is the means to an end. His true goal is to not be the bad guy anymore, or even more specifically, to not be treated like trash all the time. I can't spend another 30 years living alone in the garbage. I'm not going back without a medal. And by the end of the movie, he has a friend, the Nicelanders are being nice to him, and he's no longer living in the garbage. The focus of the plot is not on the metal, but on Ralph's character development and self-actualization. The problem with War 2 is that it starts with them trying to fix Vanellope's game and leaves off with Ralph's codependency issues. They bicker throughout the movie, sure, but their friendship doesn't even provide the rising action for the plot. The two are actually unrelated. Ralph and Vanellope are focused on saving Sugar Rush, while their relationship just kind of lingers in the background like GORD until it suddenly becomes the focus of the movie. If the friendship was important to the plot, the reason Vanellope would have gone to the internet would have been because she was bored of Sugar Rush and desperate to find something new. Ralph, being codependent and concerned about her own turbo, goes in after her, and the two get lost or have to complete a quest to return to the arcade or something. That's the kind of plot this ending actually belongs to. And what's funny is that because the ending is so unconnected to everything else plot-wise, the epilogue is basically just the writers desperately trying to resolve plot points at Mach 5. Oh yeah, Felix and Calhoun, remember them? They were in the movie for five minutes once. Then again, it might be a good thing that they were only there for five minutes, or otherwise their characters might have been completely ruined, like Laugh and Penelope's. Speaking of which...
So here's a question. What's Ralph's character in the first movie? Well, he's just kind of an everyman. The trailers even outright say it. He's strong, but that's not really notable in a world where giant turtles breathe fire. He's not stupid, but he's not a genius either. He's got a bit of a temper to him and can be gruff, but isn't in rage mode 24-7. He's just kind of a person. This is why Ralph's my favorite Disney protagonist. We can't all relate to being royalty or having cool powers, but we have all been Ralph at one point. But in War 2... How do I put it? So you know that scene in War 1 wherein Ralph stupidly sneaks into Hero's duty and is kind of being a cowardly man-baby? Imagine if you took that scene and stretched it out to fill an hour and 30 minutes, then removed all context as to why Ralph is acting that way. You would have Wreck-It Ralph 2, a movie. First off, Ralph in this movie is stupid. Like, really, really stupid, much more so than the first movie. Heck, I wouldn't even really call him stupid in the first movie. Is he especially smart in War 1? No, not at all. But he's not really all that dumb, either. I watched War 2 first, then rewatched the first movie to confirm this. Sure enough, I can only find two instances of Ralph being stupid. One is this line. Listen, is there any chance I could go with you to your game and, you know, maybe get one of those medals? Negatory! They... What does that mean, maybe? No! And the other is him sneaking into Hero's duty despite the soldier's warning. And even those are somewhat justified. He hasn't encountered military lingo before, and he simply underestimated how scary and intense modern video games can be. He even has some logical ideas, like going to Felix to fix Penelope's cart. Compare that to this. Oh, 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 oh. Ah! Oh, nice kitty! Nice kitty! Oh, look at that little egg guy. He's got on one of those hats that smart people wear. I bet he could help us. 305. 305, gonna get us 310. Can you bid 310? 310. 315. 320. 325. Oh, man, this guy's good. He keeps coming up with numbers like it's nothing. I have $43,000? Kid, we only needed 27000 and one. We're done. Oh, no, no, no. No, that's forty-three dollars. Forty-three? That's not even half of twenty-seven thousand and one. The last one is also a good example of how badly written Ralph is in this because it's not even a hard scene to fix. Picture, same setup. Ralph and Penelope go to bid. Bidder raises the cost. Ralph says something like, "Oh, is that so? Fine then, one k." Penelope questions where they're going to get that kind of money, but Ralph reassures her he's got this. They win the bid. They go to pay, and Ralph slaps down a bag of coins. Spent all day collecting those at Mario's place, he declares. It's only when the clerk tells him that they only accept cash or credit does Ralph realize his mistake. Do you see the difference? That would have been stupid, but it also would have made sense that Ralph, as a video game character, wouldn't be considering the fact that video game currencies aren't accepted on the internet. There's a difference between him being short-sighted and having a limited viewpoint and him being Patrick Star. He's Patrick Star in this. Sometimes his stupidity is so extreme it even whips around and harms the rest of his character. There's this whole scene where he goes to unleash this virus, and it's like, you know how dangerous viruses are. You literally just spent the first movie dealing with them. Why did you just forget this all of a sudden? Hello? But perhaps one of the most jarring moments to me was how he reacted to Vanellope losing her game in this movie. <laughs> Come on, are you kidding? You sleep in, you do no work, then you go to Tappers with me every night. I've literally just described paradise. It's not something I see people point out a lot, but this is actually a really obvious moment of him being out of character. Ralph was not this self-centered in the first movie, and he should have had more sympathy for Vanellope in this scene. Compare the clip that I just showed you to this scene in War 1. Here you go, buddy. It's fresh. Straight from Pac-Man's. Hang in there, guys. It's not even just that he's being selfish in War 2, it's that the scene doesn't make sense with his background. The reason he gives Cuba at something to eat, the reason he chases off the other sugar rush racers after they push Vanellope into a chocolate mud puddle, the reason he starts to warm up to Vanellope after she mentions living in Cola Mountain. Ralph's backstory is that the Nicelanders destroyed his home to build the apartments, leaving him to sleep on a pile of bricks and trash every night. Ralph not being sympathetic to Vanellope when her home is gone doesn't make sense for his character because... He himself spent most of his life in that same miserable situation. And speaking of an LP, I should also discuss how Ralph's dynamic with her changes drastically in this movie. Yes, Ralph and Penelope are friends in the first movie, but they have more of a brother and sister kind of dynamic to them. 
Now, after all, that's kind of how you act around small children when you're an adult. You kind of intentionally distance yourself and lower yourself down to their level to talk to them, and you don't really do the same activities you do with them that you do with your adult friends. But in this movie, they're like weirdly buddy-buddy. Ralph isn't a brotherly adult figure here, instead he's like her BFF and barely does anything without her, and in all honesty, it's kind of creepy. It might not be so bad except the movie depicts Ralph as being codependent towards her. Now, this is not inherently bad. After all, she is the only friend Ralph's ever had, so it makes sense for him to find it hard to let her go. But combine that with him going way too clingy with her compared to the first movie, and it almost starts to give off super uncomfortable, almost ex-boyfriend stalker vibes. I mean, Penelope is, like, what, 10? And Ralph's over here getting jealous that she makes a new friend, sabotages her game to force her to stay with him, and mopes any time they're away from each other for more than five minutes. She's supposed to be my best friend. No, this can't be right. No, she's been brainwashed. That's what this is, because the Vanellope I know would never abandon me like that. I gotta, I gotta get her out of there now. Hey. Call the police. To me, it would have made much more sense and been much more in character if Ralph was being protective of Vanellope because he was concerned for her safety. Kid, you can't be wandering around on the internet. There's like porn out there. After all, slaughter race is insanely dangerous. Maybe his dislike of Shank isn't because Vanellope is friends with her, but just because he doesn't know if she can be trusted, considering her name is literally Shank. There's some degree of codependency running under that, but it would be in conjunction with genuine concern, which would fit better than him just obsessing over a small child constantly. He mentions her staying safe once in the movie when she leaves to be a pop-up, but it comes across as more of an excuse than genuine concern, given how he acts in the rest of the movie. There are other things I could complain about Rolf's character in this. Anyone noticed how many fat jokes there are in this movie? Like, War One had exactly two minor mentions of him being fat, and meanwhile this movie will not shut up about him being a quote-unquote big boy. But I've rambled about this for long enough, so let's focus on how they handled Penelope's character. Spoilers, they handled it badly. Now, I will say that her character is not as badly butchered as Ralph's is. However, the big problem here is her main motivation in the movie. She's tired of Sugar Rush and ends up abandoning it in favor of a game she was in for like five seconds. Now, there's a lot of things wrong with this ending, but let's save that mental breakdown for later in the video. Let's just focus on what this means for Vanellope as a character. In my opinion, this motivation makes her seem very shallow. She does the same thing every day, sure, but so does her and literally everyone else in the arcade, and you don't see them going turbo. Like, not only has she not been doing this for very long, but she's actually been doing it for much less longer than her fellow racers due to being a glitch for many years. So her motivation ends up making her look selfish, especially when she doesn't even stop to consider how her decision to leave will impact her game. But on top of that, it also contradicts her core motivation in the first movie. All she wants in the first movie is, well... I just want to race like you guys! You will never be a racer, because you're a glitch, and that's all you'll ever be! Much like Ralph just wants some respect and some time once in a while, all Penelope wants is to race and be accepted by her peers. To have her immediately get bored of doing so after she accomplishes her goal would be like if Ralph did accept Penelope's offer to have him live with her in the palace at the end of War One, despite him finally achieving what he wanted back home. And besides, I've got a job to do too. It may not be as fancy as being president, but it's my duty. And it's a big duty. It just doesn't sit right. I should also point out that one of the main concerns of her achieving her goal in the first movie was whether or not the players would like her. This even forms the big falling out between the two towards the end, as her observer her game will be unplugged if this isn't the case. She even fist bumps the player at the end, like how cute is that? But here, not only is she just bored and frustrated by the players, but she kind of discards them entirely, arguing that no one will miss her if she left, despite some players literally just mentioning that she was her favorite at the beginning. Compare this. I mean, am I ready to be a real racer? Ralph, what if the gamers don't like me? Who doesn't love a brat with dirty hair? Come on. Those people are gonna love you. To this. <gasps> so you were spying on me? Hey, you're not exactly innocent here. You were gonna ditch everybody and abandon Sugar Rush. Oh, please, I'm one of 16 racers. They'd never miss me. And you can kind of see how this doesn't quite fit with her character. 
And it's like, well, okay, people change over time. And I guess if it's been 20 years or something, it's understandable that you feel differently. Or it takes place six years after the original. Like, six years should not be enough time to cause her to have already grown apathetic to what was all she once wanted. And the worst part? Honestly, this kind of makes me not care about her motivations in this movie either. Because if she earns her goal of staying at Slaughter Race, what's to stop her from getting bored of it and leaving for another game? Yeah, she seems pretty happy there, but she also seemed pretty freaking happy at the end of the first movie, and look where we are now. And unlike Sugar Rush, Renelope is only in Slaughter Race for like five minutes. How am I supposed to care when she'll just go to a different game in another six years? I just... I never thought this movie could get me not to care about a character I like so much, but it did. This is getting depressing. Let's move on to something less depressing, shall we? Hey, hey, I said less depressing. Less. This is more. So, spoilers, the world building Ralph breaks the internet is bad. Like, really bad. Film world building is cheap and uninspired, but it's particularly egregious when it starts outright throwing out major plot elements from the first movie. You know the basic plot of this movie? Vanellope breaks her game and they travel to the internet to fix it. There are three, I am not joking here, three major pieces of world building from the first movie that they have to retcon to make this plot work. First, where one established that Ralph not being in his game during the day is bad, as it'll make people think the game is broken. Here, Ralph just makes Vanellope's track in the middle of the day as if it's no big deal. It's extra drawing when you consider that Surge is still patrolling the area, even calling out the Sugar Rush citizens for leaving their game during the unplugging, and that Ralph is just standing out in the open even when the players are present. He's standing right there, Litwop. Just turn 25 degrees and you'll see him. <laughs> Secondly, in the first movie, Fix-It Felix Jr. is left plugged in when it's broken. It isn't unplugged until the guy comes to take it away. In this movie, Litwop just... Um, plugs the game immediately. Why the inconsistency? I guess you could argue he called in a guy to look at Fix-It Felix Jr. and not Sugar Rush, but considering the guy shows up with a dolly, I don't think much fixing was going to take place. So there doesn't seem to be a reason for this beyond just ignoring how broken games were handled in the first movie to serve a plot point. And finally, there's one little detail in War 1 that I think we just accidentally looked over in this whole plot. Sugar Rush is a two-person game! Complete with two wheels. Hmm. New racers daily. Sweet. I got next game. Go away, kid. We're gonna play all nine of today's racers. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Oopsie doopsie. Guess we'll just pretend we didn't see that. And that's kind of the thing about this movie's world building. It doesn't expand upon plot points. It just disregards them when they get in the way. Ralph leaving to go to the internet during the day? No worries, Felix will cover for him. How? Who cares? Why bother working with the previous movie's world building when you can just ignore it? Why put in effort when you can just be lazy and write away plot points? Why would you bother when you can make money regardless? You know, I think the most glaring example of this is the whole thing with Vanellope having her code added to Slaughter Race. You see, the first movie does this really great thing in regards to its world building. It would not make sense for video game characters to die permanently when they are killed because they have multiple lives and are still there when you start a new game. However, if the characters cannot die permanently, there would be no stakes in the first movie. In order to make this work, they just came up with a simple rule that if you die in your own game, you regenerate. If you die in a different game, you die in real life. Thus, the climax of the finale still has tension. The big problem with Vanellope just being able to have her code oh so casually added to Slaughter Race is that it kind of ruins both the climax and the world building of both movies. Like, first off, why doesn't everyone just program themselves into games they're visiting? The first movie implied that tampering with the code is not something most video game characters do, probably because you're basically a god at that point. But Chang doesn't have any qualms with doing it, nor does it seem like it's hard for her to do. So they... don't have a reason not to. Why is Sonic doing PSAs about staying safe outside your game when it's so easy to avoid not dying? I guess the arcade characters might just not know how to do this, but then it really cheapens everything to know how easy this problem would have been to fix. Not to mention the problems this raises with Turbo. In the original film, one clever piece of foreshadowing to his true identity is that Sugar Rush works by Mario Kart rules. You don't seem to die, you just get tossed off the track, thus making it a safe game for him. When he does die in the climax, he dies for real because he wasn't part of that game. 
But according to this movie, game resets will kill foreign characters. So presumably, if you have your code added to the game, you'd respawn when everything resets, or otherwise Penelope is going to be in trouble. But that means that either Turbo should have respawned but didn't, causing a plot hole, or he didn't program himself in, making him look foolish. And believe it or not, this isn't the only problem this causes for the climax. You see, like I said earlier, the only thing providing tension in these plots is the fact that the characters can die. Ralph sacrificing himself at the end of the first movie wouldn't have had such an impact if he just would have popped right back up like it was no big deal. But according to this film, he could have just programmed himself in there at any time, thus meaning that the entire scene now comes across as kind of stupid. It even comes back to bite the second movie in the ass, because when everyone's panicking over slaughter race being reset, the whole thing just once again comes across as cheap. Just program yourselves in there and we won't be having this conversation. This explanation as a whole is so poorly thought out that I'm kind of not convinced that they didn't write the ending of the second movie and then at the last second went, wait, wouldn't that mean Penelope's life could be in danger? thus causing them to insert a half-rushed explanation that makes no sense. And speaking of half-rushed endings and explanations... So I think it's generally agreed upon that the ending to War 2 is very not good, mostly because Vanellope going turbo kind of defeats the point of the entire first movie. And yes, it's very not good. But I think people tend to miss the finer details of why this is. You see, the problems with the ending go a lot deeper than superficial stuff. But in order to explain why, we have to figure out if Vanellope did indeed go turbo, and why going turbo is considered to be such a terrible thing in the first place. To answer the first question, I would say it's a resounding yes. While the first movie never explicitly defines going turbo, we do know that it involves another character game jumping while their arcade is open. I've heard some fans argue that going turbo refers to a character trying to maliciously take over a game, but the only person who makes this association is King Candy himself, for obvious reasons. Considering that the mere idea of Ralph having a better life immediately ignites claims that he's going turbo from Bad Anon, and that Qbert declares Ralph sneaking into Hero's duty is going turbo, it's safe to say that the definition is something as follows. Going turbo, verb, when a video game character abandons their own game during the arcade's open hours in order to participate in another game. Ergo, with the definition being so simple, it's nearly impossible to argue that Vanellope didn't go turbo by staying in Slaughter Race. Now, back to that second question. Vanellope may have gone turbo, but that second movie depicts this as being a good decision for her. In fact, Ralph's entire plot in the first movie ultimately ended better than if he had never gone turbo in the first place. So what makes the act of leaving your game so terrible? The in-universe answer the first movie gives us is straightforward enough. Going turbo is bad because a character's absence can lead to their game being deemed broken and unplugged. Likewise, it can also lead to the new game being unplugged for the same reason. Turbo ended up putting both games and himself out of order. For good. Heck, the entire first plot of the first movie is Ralph going turbo himself, and those two exact things almost happen. Now, they make some attempt to address these claims in the second movie, but unsurprisingly, they didn't do it very well. First, Vanellope claims that no one will miss her if she leaves Sugar Rush due to a random roster. Now, on the one hand, there is some truth to this. Vanellope's presence isn't required for the game to function, and King Candy was disposed of without the game being unplugged. However, the issue is that some of the players directly call Vanellope their favorite at the beginning, suggesting that Vanellope is fairly popular. And the popularity of the game kind of matters here, as Litwalk establishes that Sugar Rush doesn't make that much money. Are you kidding me? How much? That's more than this game makes in a year! Ergo, if Vanellope leaves and the gamers stop playing because their favorite character isn't playable anymore, well, that could indeed lead to Sugar Rush being unplugged. Is it guaranteed? No, of course not. But it is a possibility, and it makes Vanellope come across as very self-centered and not even consider how her absence might impact things. It's even worse for Ralph, as he knows firsthand what could happen if she leaves, yet he never brings it up either. And when it comes to Vanellope's impact on Slaughter Race, the second movie does what it does best and just doesn't address it. Thinking about it logically, however, I'd say that she's probably at least a mild danger to the game. War 2 is so poorly written that the hour it forgot a plot point, that being that the virus that Ralph unleashed is never actually dealt with in the ending. Early in the movie, that virus copies Vanellope's glitch and spreads it, i.e. Vanellope being in the game now poses a security hazard. Will it get the game servers nuked or whatever the online equivalent of unplugging is? Probably not, given that it can be reset, but it doesn't seem like the safest option, and that goes for both the game and an LP. You see, unlike arcade games, online games have devs that can look at the code and change it any time they want to. 
That means that they start getting reports of a strange, foreign, glitchy character that clearly doesn't belong in this game, and their first logical reaction would be to delete it. Thus putting Vanellope in a massive amount of danger, something that the movie never addresses. Is she just betting her life on the idea that the devs will like her enough to stay? So from an in-universe standpoint, Vanellope going turbo is bad because it's a danger to both games and even herself. Sure, everything might work out, but nothing is guaranteed, which seems like a pretty massive risk to take when she could just go back to her own game and stay there. Especially when lives and homes other than her own are at stake. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. But that's not even getting into the real meat of the problem. You see, here's the fun thing about War 1. It's actually well written, and because of that, the going turbo thing goes a lot deeper than just some world building. Here's the question I want to ask. What is the moral of Wreck-It Ralph? Think about it hard. I've heard some people say that's a simple be yourself message, but I'd argue that isn't true, or at least is a massive oversimplification of things. After all, Ralph isn't not being himself or putting on a fake personality or something, he just wants to improve his quality of life. No, the real moral is a bit more complicated than that, and it's stated right at the beginning of the movie. For Ralph, we get it, but we can't change who we are. And the sooner you accept that, the better off your game and your life will be. Remember earlier how I said that the plot of War One is really just Ralph growing as a person? He was literally told the answer to his problem right at the start. It just took him the entire movie to actualize it. I'm bad, and that's good. I will never be good, and that's not bad. There's no one I'd rather be than me. Notice how the second Ralph suggests that he doesn't want to be the bad guy, Bad Annan's immediate reaction is to assume that he's going turbo. He hasn't said anything about doing so, but they make the connection because going turbo is basically the opposite of understanding yourself and your position in life. Do you ever wonder why Turbo himself is the villain of this movie? Because unlike many of Disney's other movies, there's actually like a specific thematic purpose to this plot twist. You see, in movies that are actually good, the villain tends to be the antithesis of the moral you're trying to get across. For example, The Incredibles kind of has an anti-tall poppy syndrome thing going for it. Why the par's name is, well, par. Why they're forced into hiding. Why they argue over Dash's participation in sports. Heck, it's only as I'm writing this that I'm realizing that Syndrome's name like re originated from the aforementioned tall poppy theme. And what is Syndrome's master plan? And when I'm old and I've had my fun, I'll sell my inventions so that everyone can be superheroes. Everyone can be super. And when everyone's super, <laughs> no one will be. Turbo is the villain of the first wreck at Ralph because Turbo is a foil to Ralph in the opposite of the moral. Turbo effectively does what Ralph narrowly avoids doing in this movie, destroying two games, all because he wants something more out of life. Turbo is basically the antithesis of understanding oneself, to the point where he is literally in disguise throughout the entire movie. And that's why the ending of War 2 is such a big problem. Yes, there are in-universe and practical reasons that you could use to argue whether or not the ending works. But at the end of the day, the reason Vanellope going turbo cannot work is that basically means that War 2 looks at the entire moral, the entire point of War 1, and says, no. Messing up things like characters and world building is bad enough, but to go actively against the morals of War 1 spits in the face of the original movie. And that is, perhaps, the worst crime any sequel could commit. I can fix it! So I want to disclaim that this section is not me trying to prove them better than the writers. Writing movies professionally involves a lot of collaboration from other people, executive meddling, etc. I'm also not a movie writer, and I don't know how well my ideas would translate onto the screen. With that said, however, I want to do this section because it feels more fair to me. Anyone can sit there and complain about a bad story, but I feel like it's more constructive and helpful if I take my own shot at it to try to show that these things can be improved upon. While I've been providing fixes throughout the video, those were mostly small tweaks to pre-existing plot points. As I've found over here, the problems with War 2 are ingrained into its very plot, ergo a complete rewrite is needed to properly address everything. As an additional challenge, I'm attempting to rewrite the movie following the same basic plot beats as War 2 does. This means that Ralph and Penelope still have to get to the internet, their codependency needs to be present and resolved by the end, and Penelope still has to leave her game. So we have to start this rewrite by asking ourselves, 
What is the biggest issue with the second movie? I would argue it's in the basic plot set up itself with Sugar Rush being broken. It takes three pieces of ignored world building and retcons to even function, messes up both Renelope's and Ralph's characterizations, becomes completely irrelevant by the end because it doesn't connect back to the codependency idea, and leads to Penelope going for Turbo in the end and all the problems that raises. However, if we remove the plot about Penelope's game breaking, it raises the question of why the characters need to go to the internet in the first place. This is what is known in plot terms as the inciting incident. We are going to remove the original inciting incident and it needs to be replaced with something else. In order to figure out what that something else should be, we need to focus on our core themes and concept. If Ruff and Penelope must be split up for some reason, is there a way to do it without them going turbo? Well, we do have one instance of this in the original movie. Qbert and co leaving to go live and fix it Felix Jr. isn't going turbo because they no longer have their original game. Ergo, it doesn't go against the moral, nor are they endangering their non-existent own game, or Rouse considering they appear in a bonus level. We also know that the core concept of the first movie is simple, video games, specifically arcade games. The concept of this one is the internet. What's the connection between the two? Well, to put it simply, the presence of online and console gaming is basically what killed the arcade game. After all, why leave your house to pay for every single game you play when you could just sit on your ass at home and play Mario Party for the 67th time in a row? Therefore, the major plot rewrite I propose is this. Rather than the inciting incident being Vanellope's game breaking, the inciting incident should be Litwalk's arcade shutting down. Here's what I'm thinking. So we start the movie with a montage of Vanellope racing, which fades into her chatting to Ralph about how her day went on top of the nice land apartment building. Vanellope points out how great her last prayer was and asks what Ralph's day was like. He responds as same old, same old, and that things have been kind of slow since not many players show up these days as they used to, reasoning that's probably because of the holidays. He pauses, then mentions that he did notice one weird thing as we cut to flashback. While I was up on top of the building at one point, he looked at the screen and could have sworn that he witnessed a player somehow playing a game on their phone, using that new Wi-Fi thing that was plugged in a few months ago. Penelope points out that this isn't possible and jokes they must be going the way of Litwalk's Nana, but Ralph isn't convinced. Regardless, the two start discussing what game they want to hang out in tonight when Ralph notices something. To their shock, there's a player in the arcade after it's already closed. Penelope panics, thinking that she needs to leave, but Ralph points out that there's a tutorial screen up right now explaining the game, so she's fine as long as the guy doesn't start a game, though she hides behind Ralph just in case. As they watch, they wonder why there's a player here so late. Then Ralph notices the company name sewn into the man's shirt pocket and realizes they're not a player, they're a collector. Sure enough, as we count that outside the game, Litwalk is having a conversation with the guy. He points out how it's a shame to have to close down and retire, but the arcade isn't making enough money to pay the rent, and the new Wi-Fi isn't helping to pull in players like he hoped it would. The collector offers his sympathies and offers him 6K for Fix-It Felix, as it's the first edition of a classic game. However, he offers a much smaller amount for Sugar Rush and Hero's Duty. As we cut back inside the game, Litwalk thanks him for his time and says they'll think about it. Ralph realizes, to his horror, that every game is going to be unplugged. As we cut to Game Central Station, everyone is in a panic over what's going to happen. Some accuse Ralph and Vanellope of lying about what they saw, but Calhoun backs them up, saying that she and Felix saw the same thing. Solid Bill monotonely wonders if they're all going to die, and Felix tries to reassure everyone that the consoles are just being moved. However, Ralph counters this by pointing out that only some are being bought, and even the ones who get plugged in will be separated from their loved ones. Calhoun objects, saying that she's not going to let that happen to her and Felix, or anyone else for that matter. Surge offers for everyone to bunker down the station, but that won't work either as the power strip will be unplugged eventually as well. Penelope asks what they're going to do, and Ralph responds that he doesn't know. Then, as he casts his gaze across the arcade, it lands on the Wi-Fi plug. He remembers the gamer earlier, playing on a phone, and realizes what they need to do. They need to escape through the internet. Surge objects, arguing that's too dangerous, but Ralph points out that's already dangerous here. However, he agrees that they can't have everyone in the arcade wandering the internet aimlessly. Penelope chimes in, volunteering to go ahead with Ralph and scout out new games for everyone. As she points out, the unplugging shouldn't happen until the holiday break is over in about four days. The arcade is closed for the holidays in the meanwhile, so the games will be fine if they're gone for a bit. Felix offers to go with, but Ralph says they need to stay with everyone and prepare for evacuation. Calhoun agrees with this, and Ralph and Penelope enter the internet. Before we continue forward, I want to point out what these changes do for the plot. First, the aforementioned retcons needed to make the original plot function are no longer necessary. And secondly, the ending of the movie now has a proper setup. Unlike in the actual movie, wherein Ralph's codependency has nothing to do with Sugar Rush being repaired, this version's inciting incident ensures the eventual split between the two will occur organically. 
This setup also means that Penelope doesn't have to go turbo at the end, as she won't have her original game to return to, and it should make them splitting up feel much more organic. Now, once they get to the internet with 80% less ads than the actual movie's depiction of it, we have a brief scene wherein they soak in the sites, and then they notice a bunch of people using something called Knows More to find websites. Penelope suggests that they do an online search for games, but when they talk to Knows More, he immediately assumes her office is a virus, much like what happened in an earlier draft of the actual script, and calls in bodyguards, i.e. antivirus software, to arrest him. Ralph and Penelope flee, and in the process run into Slaughter Race and take Shank's car. A similar scene to the chase in an actual movie occurs, and Shank shows up and gets rid of the antivirus for now. While she still makes Vanellope give her back her car, she's impressed with her driving skills and offers for Vanellope to come back and do a real race sometime. Vanellope is obviously smitten with the game, but Ralph doesn't trust it due to how dangerous it is. They explain their goal, and Shank advises them to go back to the main website that they entered through to find more games, which is basically the movie's version of Steam. As Ralph and Vanellope leave, I cut to Felix and Calhoun again and have a brief scene of them teaching them the Icelanders proper evacuation procedures. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! What's the Everybody procedure, everyone? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay calm! Wait, 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 wait! Everybody just calm down! Back to the A-plot, this is the point wherein Ralph and Vanellope go to not Steam and access one of the games there. The game in question could maybe be wherein we meet Yes in this version, not just as an algorithm, but as a character for a fashion-based game or something. She gives them the lowdown on how downloadable internet games work, and we get some more world building here. My rationale behind having these be downloadable games is that each game has its own code. Ergo, there's no danger of being found by the devs because Ralph and Co. would only be in one person's specific game. She also agrees to have some few video game characters herself before she sends them off to investigate more games. At this point, I'd have a brief cop song montage of them entering various games and getting into shenanigans. This could be expanded into several scenes depending on runtime. As the montage ends, we see Ralph and Vanellope in a sci-fi world similar to Heroes Duty, but it's more of a futuristic life simulator when people do things like water plants and read self-help books. They agree that this would be ideal for the Heroes Duty soldiers, and gleefully note how over the last two days they've managed to find games for most of the arcade's residents. Ralph points out that they just need to find a game for Vanellope's racers and a game for themselves, and that'll be set. Vanellope, however, is confused. Can she stay in a racing game with other racers? It isn't her code, after all. Ralph points out that they barely see each other then, and Vanellope hesitantly agrees that it's better for them to stay together. However, at this point the antivirus software finally catches up with them, and this time are successful at apprehending Ralph. Vanellope promises to break him out of jail as he's taken away. This would be another good point to cut to Felix and Calhoun, who are helping round up Sugar Rush citizens. We touched upon some of the elements from the actual movie here, such as their interest in adopting kids and search pointing out that the racers are feral. Cut back to internet jail, i.e. a firewall. There he meets a Mr. JP's family, who is definitely not arrested for distributing tracking cookies through his website, why would you think that, huh? <laughs> Ralph asks him if he knows of any video games around that would be similar to Pixel Felix Jr., and his family says he'll be happy to show him the perfect game if he helps break him out. Ralph agrees and manages to escape by wrecking the firewall in one good punch. Meanwhile, Vanellope travels back to Slaughter Race, figuring that Shank probably knows a few things about a good jailbreak. Shank agrees to help and allows Vanellope to ramp one of the player cars. However, Ralph and his family are already gone by the time they get there, with Ralph having left a note explaining what game they are going to and they meet her in front of Slaughter Race. Vanellope is disappointed that I broke out with her, as she is very hyped for a jailbreak. But Shank offers to take Vanellope back to her game and do a proper race while they wait for him to show up. Cut back to Felix and Calhoun, who have semi-successfully wrangled their Sugar Rush racers into helping them assist some characters into packing their stuff. As they go to leave, Calhoun pauses, noticing that the lights are on in the arcade. Felix points out that's probably just Litwalk, but Calhoun argues that Litwalk wouldn't have much of a reason to be here if he was still on break. Then it dawns on them. Much like they're preparing everyone for the evacuation ahead of time, he's coming in to unplug the cabinets in preparation for the cellar. He's two days early. They grab Sonic, who's fast and familiar with Wi-Fi, and send him into one route. As we return to Ralph and his family, Ralph is overjoyed. The game they're in is maybe akin to a steamed version of Minecraft. Blocky and 8-bit, lots of fixing and wrecking, and more than enough space to house all the Nice Landers, plus the Sugar Rush Racers and Calhoun. He's positive and LP will love it as they leave and return outside of Slaughter Race. When they get to the meetup location, Ralph is confused by Vanellope's absence and goes inside of the game, witnessing her finish her waste with Shank. This is where we get the two's fallout as we shift into Act 3. Ralph argues that she shouldn't be here, but Vanellope argues that she had to go somewhere while he was AWOL. Ralph perks up as he starts to explain about the new game he found and how much she'll enjoy it. Vanellope, however, hesitates. As she points out, she's a racer. It's in her code. Wouldn't it be better if her and the other racers moved to a racing game like Slaughter Race? Ralph argues, no, they'd never see each other if they separate, and besides, Slaughter Race is insanely dangerous. Vanellope argues that it's not that dangerous to shank around, and besides, how would he know when he's barely been in the game? 
The argument about where they should go continues to escalate, reading to the scene of an LP breaking the metal and running off, Shank pursuing her. As Ralph collects his now broken metal and realizes how badly he fucked up, Shonic shows up to tell him about the games being unplugged. Ralph sends him back, telling him to inform Felix and Calhoun that they're ready and should start evacuating everyone into the Wi-Fi. Ralph tells Sonic he'll meet everyone by the internet's entrance, then realizes as he zips off they'll never get there in time. Shane comes over to tell him off, but Ralph acknowledges that he was in the wrong immediately and asks her to take him to Penelope. From here, we have a scene similar to the Fungin scene in the first movie, with Ralph acknowledging that he was a stink brain. Penelope explains that it's not that she doesn't want to be able to hang out anymore, but it's important for her to be able to race, and they can still meet up on the internet once in a while. Ralph agrees and makes her promise to stay safe out there. They hug and Ralph adds that, oh yeah, the arcade's shutting down now and they need to mass evacuate immediately. Shank offers Penelope a chance to drive her awesome car, much to her delight. Now, notice how the codependency subplot has changed here. While Ralph is still codependent, it also stems from concern about Penelope's safety, which is further feared by not wanting to lose his friend. It makes him much less creepy, as he's taking on more of a parental role instead of a stalker-esque one. And it should help that he recognizes his mistake almost immediately, rather than being a zombie virus, that he relieved, mind you, to make him realize it. Meanwhile, Penelope is no longer in there on herself. If her game's being unplugged anyway, she's not going to be turbo if she relocates. Moving on, they drive back to Game Central Station, which is crowded with characters. Calhoun is helping to evacuate everyone, which is going surprisingly well thanks to the efforts. As this happens, machines are slowly being unplugged. Calhoun realizes that Felix is to him fix it Felix Jr., evacuating people and almost rushes them to save him. However, Penelope stops her, pointing out that her glitching will make it faster for her to get in and out. Ralph almost insists that it's way too dangerous for her to go and to leave it to Calhoun, but Penelope reassures them that she'll make it. Shank said she is the fastest racer this side of the internet, after all. Ralph agrees and Penelope goes in. She finds Felix and glitches him out in the random nice lander he's saving out of the apartment, but she can't make it to the entrance with both of them slowing her down. Upon realizing she's not going to make it out in time, Shank drives her car in and Penelope glitches them all into it, saving everyone moments before Fix-It Felix Jr. is unplugged. Calhoun yells at Felix for being an idiot while hugging him hard enough to break his back. I feel like shifting the focus to Penelope here would help the emotional resolutions. In the original, all the focus is on Ralph. Penelope doesn't really do anything, and neither does Shank, during the climax other than talk to Nose more. All the focus is on Ralph. The problem with this is that Penelope has a pretty big character arc, so it feels like she should at least share some of the action. Here, this climax kind of reflects the codependency theme of the movie, with Penelope wanting to make her own choices and Ralph needing to accept that and let her go. Think of it like the ending of Finding Nemo with the net. The main emotional core of the plot is done, now we have a final scene for both characters that emphasize the theme and their character development. Felix and Calhoun also get to play a part instead of being left out completely, and Shank has a moment to prove her reliability to Ralph as well. From here, we follow everyone into the Wi-Fi and into the internet, and Ralph congratulates Penelope on a cool rescue. He also thanks Shank, acknowledging that maybe she isn't as bad as he thought she was. Felix draws his attention to the massive crowd of characters, and Ralph begins showing everyone around to their new homes. We get a final lingering shot as the multi-plug is unplugged. As we fade in, we see the last non-main characters, Calhoun's men, entering their new game. She bids them goodbye as they're downloaded. We move on to Slaughter Race, and Ralph gives Penelope a final farewell, just wishing he could make sure that she was safe. Stanley quite literally pops up and offers them a tracking cookie, which will allow them to keep contact with each other, similar to the hologram phone in the actual movie. They accept, and Stanley takes off as the end of hour, shows up, and tries to attack him again. They split the metal pieces between them before Penelope leaves. We cut outside and watch the locker room with the open sign, then turn off the lights in the arcade for good. As the movie ends, we get a scene similar to that of the actual film. Ralph is going over some of the highlights of their new home. As it turns out, some of the Sugar Rush candy citizens didn't want to go to Slaughter Race, and as such, Felix and Calhoun have adopted approximately 40 children, much to their delight. Ralph has joined a book group with some of the original characters of this game and has been practicing his building skills. They're not good. Penelope contacts him being a tracking cookie and offers to meet him sometime this week when their Slaughter Race player is going to be away, which Ralph accepts. Penelope says goodbye, Shane calls her over for a ways, and we watch Ralph smile and join Felix for a New Year's party. Now, you may have liked my version. Alternatively, you may have thought that, that was the worst piece of crap sequel idea you've ever heard and you're drafting your angry comments as I speak. But here's the thing. I did try. I tried to keep characterizations consistent with the first movie. I tried to make the story feel like an organic follow-up that explores Ralph and Penelope's friendship. 
I tried to reinforce the same themes and morals from the first movie while exploring the modernization of video games. I don't know if I succeeded, but I tried. Because that's the thing about War 2. It doesn't feel like anyone tried. I'm sure there are plenty of talented artists and animators putting it all into this, and I respect that. But in terms of writing, in terms of the characters, in terms of the entire plot, none of this felt like it was written by people who understood the first movie. And more importantly, none of it felt like it was written by people who cared about the original movie. Listen, if you're like me and you like watching hour-long analysis videos of movies you never watched instead of being productive, do yourself a favor and watch the original Bracket Ralph. It's a charming movie with great characters and world building, and is one of Disney's best in my humble opinion. And it's far, far better than this movie. Now let's close out with the bad guy affirmation. I am bad. And that's bad. I will never be good. And that's bad. I am bad. Okay, gang, see you next week. I'm just a little black cube of darkness. A little black cube of darkness. Black cube of darkness. A little black cube. My edges are sharp. My corners are pointy. My complexion's opaque Just looking, yeah, looking for a place to fit in But I'm never the right shape